Um, we welcome everyone here and the purpose of this webinar is really to um, bring together some expertise around managing in this COVID pandemic, uh, the power of the mind and the power of the heart. Um, unfortunately, um, due to some adverse, um, due to unfortunate circumstances, Dr. Alvarez will not be able to join us today. He's been working night and day with the heart transplants and is, and is quite exhausted. So we will have to reschedule his uh, meeting to another time, which we look forward to rescheduling in the new year when he has time. Um, but today we are excited to have Dr. Pawa come, Dr. Bal Pawa join us. Um, I have known Dr. Bal Pawa for 20 years. She's a colleague of mine. And she's been in the practice uh, as, as a family pr practitioner for over 30 years. And I must credit her to, um, to bring to me, to introduce me to mind-body medicine. She's been pivotal in that, uh, helping me to understand the power of the mind and the mind-body connection in our bodies and healing. And certainly, um, you know, Val has brought this experience um, from her own personal journey, she, you know, um, has shared this with many in, and also in her book, but that uh, with her own personal journey through an accident, she's been able to go beyond the prescriptions of pain medication and use her mind and her body and learn the tools to heal. And she actually went to uh, train at the Harvard uh, Mind Body Institute, where she was uh, training with Dr. Herbert Benson and um, understood such a, the deep connection between um, the power of the mind and the, and the connection to the body. So I, I really uh, took this opportunity to invite Abel to speak to us today because um, during this world of the COVID pandemic, we're all faced with different stressors around in our body and in our mind and anxieties and isolation and fears. And certainly um, Bell has counts counseled her, her, through herself and also through her experience with patients has counseled many people to really boost their own immunity, help heal their pain, help heal their, uh, manage their stress. And I thought it would be wonderful for her to be able to share that with us. Um, one of the unique things as well is um, I, I know Val's father as well, and he was so pivotal in his community of uh, doing a lot of interfaith work um, and, and really bringing the unity of religions and power of spirituality in people's lives so she shares that perspective as well and a beautiful combination and um, so I hope that uh, Belle will be able to share some of her insights and wisdom with us today. Good morning and thank you Nishi and uh, Sai Ram to everybody it's a pleasure to be here and uh, Nishi may not have told you but we have been on a journey together um, as friends, as colleagues, and we've had the opportunity to grow personally and spiritually and professionally. So it's a very unique friendship that we share because it's hard to find a friend on all those levels. So I feel very blessed um, to have Nishi in my life and to have this opportunity to connect with all of you as well. And I'm very passionate, as she told you, about um, communicating this message because as I was navigating my journey as a patient, a physician, one minute I leave the hospital as a physician and then I have an accident and I come back as a patient. And that really, that the whole six or seven years of navigating uh, multiple injuries and uh, surgeries and um, medication and numerous specialists taught me a very valuable lesson. We are very fortunate to live in Canada. We have a wonderful medical system, um, but the intervention side is very, very powerful. And the prevention side needs to be cultivated more. And I found that some of the deficits that exist in our medical system are that we don't involve the patient in the healing. We don't think about our innate healer, you know, the father of medicine, Hippocrates said, we have natural forces within us that are the true healers of disease. And part of that is our spiritual connection as well. And awakening that connection and awakening that ability to be self-regulated, self-controlled is a very vital part of healing that often Western medicine ignores. 
So Western and Eastern medicine, we can get the best of both worlds when we combine uh, and integrate, truly integrate the teachings of both. So what I'm hoping today is that through the PowerPoint that I'm going to share with you, that we we look at our look at our circumstances a little differently. How do we show up, and how do we control things that we can modify, and how do we accept things that we cannot modify, and how does that impact our body, especially our immune system? Right now, uh, stress is very pervasive. Everyone, if you look at the the rate of of mental health, uh, you know, the escalation in anxiety, depression, 35 to 40% increase in prescriptions for anxiety pills, depression, uh, sleeping pills, the rates have just gone through the roof in North America alone. And so if we keep reaching for drugs, drugs often have side effects. And sometimes we need medication for sure, but uh, often we don't give people enough tools. So at the end of this presentation, my hope, sincere hope, is that at least you will take some time to say, okay, how am I showing up? Am I cultivating resilience? And that is the opposite of stress because resilience is a word that is thrown around, but resilience just means how can we bend but not break under pressure? right? So we're under a lot of pressure, but we have to find skills that will help us to move through this and come out on the other side. So I'm just going to share my PowerPoint, and I hope that you can all see this. Is everyone able to see this one? Okay. So the objectives... Nishi, were you able to see that? Um, no, I'm not seeing your screen, Val. Okay, so just hold on. I'm going to go back. Let's see. There we go. Okay, so, all right. So we want to create resilience in this world. And today you're going to learn all about how does stress impact? How do the things that we think about impact our hormones of stress? And what do they do to our immune system? And what are they doing to our body as a whole? So we can use our mind to heal our body and create resilience. So many spiritual scholars have known about the mind-body connection. And we in Western medicine are just learning about it, but this is a quote from Swamiji. And he, he was very wise when he said, the main cause for illness is psychological disturbances. And many delusions and illusions uh, create havoc in our body because of the fear and the anxiety we create around it. And so we know when we're stressed that we get a very physical response. So we want to help connect the dots between our thoughts and our body today. So we know that there are many factors that impact health in today's discussion. Of course, we're not going to be able to go into all of it, genetics and diet and sleep and exercise and, and infections and injury. We can't do that, but we're going to talk about stress. And the reason I want to highlight stress is because when we are stressed, we make very bad choices for diet and nutrition. We make very bad choices for sleep. We make very bad choices for activity, and when we're under stress, it even affects our genes and our, and our genetic material. So it's really important to realize that the, the cornerstone of health begins with the mind. Maybe I can uh, request that people could mute their, um, mute their audio so that I don't hear uh, the sound. So a very big emerging field of study is called psychoneuroimmunology. And there's a lot of data coming out about how our psychology, our thoughts impact our nervous system, our brain, and how the brain then affects our immune system. And the new data is showing that we actually have an extension of our nervous system into our immune system. The immune system is called the floating brain because all the cells and the, and the various um, cytokines and 
markers that we produce in our immune system are actually a reflection of our nervous system. And we never thought about the immune system like that before. We always thought the immune system was designed to deal with infections outside of us, external toxins like viruses, parasites, bacteria. But we now know that our internal environment, our psychology, profoundly impacts our nervous system, which is now connected to our immune system as well. So let's start with a definition of stress. What is stress? And stress is our response to a trigger. And that trigger was always assumed to be something external to us. It could be something um, like a saber-toothed tiger. But we now know that stress can come in many different forms. It can be covert, very hidden away thoughts and fears of stress, fear of failure, fear of rejection, or it can be very overt, losing a job, not having money. Right now with COVID, there's a lot of fear that what's gonna to happen to our loved ones. So stress can be overt or covert. It can be acute or chronic, and our body's designed to deal with chronic, uh, deal with acute stress. We can easily, you know, um, experience a very acute stress and then go back and equilibrate our body. So if you were driving along and a dog jumped in front of your car, a bit of stress is good. It allows you to react very quickly. Your heart rate goes up, you slam on your brakes and the dog gets away. So that's a very good example of acute stress and your body goes back to normal. But many of us are consumed by chronic stress, stress that is going on for long periods of time. And so this over the last nine or 10 months, we've had a great example of seeing where this COVID crisis and this pandemic, the fear and uncertainty has really locked us into a very poor mental state. Many of us feel anxious. Many of us are experiencing low mood or depression. Many of us are reaching for things outside to soothe our behavior. So when we are experiencing chronic stress and prolonged exposure to stress hormones, that's when symptoms set in. And many people out there don't recognize that their physical symptoms may in fact be resulting from their emotional state. So our emotional state translates to our physical state. So this is a traditional model of the fight flight response. There's a saber toothed tiger, the boy goes, oh, oh, danger. And our body goes into this immediate fight or flight and we can run out of the way and get away from the tiger. Now, how this is possible is that there is a system, an apparatus in our brain called the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal access. So simply put, just think of it as a motor. It's a motor in there that revs up. It's like an engine that revs up. And when you're under stress, you're pressing on the gas that allows your body to rev up and get out of the way. But we can also turn on the brakes. But while stress is something you don't have to think about, it's automatic. It'll just come on. You don't really have to think about it. And you can just put on the gas and automatically your body can rev up into fight or flight. On the other hand, nowadays, we don't have saber tooth tigers chasing us, but we have a lot of stress in our minds, right? We think about what's going to happen tomorrow. What am I going to have money? Am our kids going to be okay? We constantly worry. So we're in a state of fight or flight a good part of the time. If you want to turn on the brakes, it now becomes more of a voluntary response. So it's something you may have to learn. And this is the research that Dr. Benson was doing at Harvard. He was a cardiologist, in fact, and he found that people live most of their lives in North America in fight or flight, but we're not putting enough emphasis on the brakes. That's called rest and repair. So how can we put the brakes on. And he devised what's called the early stages of the relaxation response, where he taught some controlled breathing and some mindfulness techniques and was able to turn on the response, which we're going to learn today. So you're going to get to do that. So this system looks complicated, but basically it's your brain sending a signal to your adrenal glands to produce stress hormones. Mm -hmm. 
So the autonomic nervous system is a complicated way of looking at that apparatus, but just think of it as your motor, gas and brakes on the one side, things speed up your body. On the other side, it slows it down. And uh, I wanted to take something that was so complex that was mostly reserved for physicians and um, healthcare providers. We all know about this, but I want to bring it to the masses. And this was the, the big idea that I wanted to share that a lot of people know stress causes disease, but they don't know that this, the conduit to cause that disease is through this system. Now, this autonomic nervous system turns on your cortisol. That is a, a hormone that we cannot live without. We, we need it, but we don't need it on all the time. So when you're under fight or flight, when you're under stress, your gas pedal is on, you produce cortisol. And cortisol is going to affect many different systems in your body. We already know that when you're under stress, your heart rate goes up your blood pressure goes up. So imagine if you live like that all the time, it's going to impact your cardiac health. It can uh, cause changes in your blood sugar. Uh, we know that cortisol causes your blood sugar to go up. So there's a very big relationship between cortisol and, and stress and type 2 diabetes as well. Uh, digestive issues, many of you know when you're under stress, you might get heartburn. Some people get irritable bowel syndrome or constipation. Uh, nerve problems, pins and needles are very common with people who are stressed. They'll say their arms go numb, their hands go numb. And of course, the mood changes that occur when cortisol is on all the time, it can profoundly impact anxiety, depression, headaches. So we know that there's a very physical impact when cortisol is in excess. But what happens is a lot of people get caught up in the whole cycle. So you, they'll start out with some anxiety and the anxiety causes an increased stress load. And the stress load then starts affecting their sleep. And they say, I can't sleep, doctor, I'm having insomnia. And then next thing you know, they're complaining of some gut problems. And the gut is very important because that's where a lot of your immune system is located. 85% of your immune system is in the gut. So then you might show up with some food allergies or gut symptoms and your serotonin is manufactured in the gut. So you might show up with some mood issues and lower levels of serotonin. And then you get more anxiety and around and around the loop we go. So at some point we have to break this cycle or the patient comes in and they're on many different drugs by the time we see them. So Nishi and I have a clinic that is founded on integrative medicine. And that's what we look at is their whole body approach and teach people how to connect the dots. So the quote I showed you earlier was from Swami and he said 80% of the symptoms are psychological and I can corroborate with the research that I have done 75 to even 90% of the symptoms that show up in a doctor's office are related to excessive chronic stress but that's not what we're treating. We're not going to the root cause, but we're seeing, okay, you have a sleep issue. And as physicians, we often are very, um, you know, we don't have a lot of time to explore their psychosocial history. We don't have time to talk about their, their impact of, of, of their relationship. And uh, we'll say, oh, you can't sleep. Okay, it's been a few months, you can't sleep. We'll try this pill okay, you're depressed and uh, I don't have time you know, to sit and counsel you, but here's an anti-anxiety or depression pill. And we're giving them a pill for every ill because we don't have the resources to, to try and spend the time with the patient to go to the root cause because our system here in Canada, as wonderful as it is, is largely based on what we call an intervention model, not a prevention model. So I'm hoping that if I can teach people to take back their, their control of their health and learn to prevent, especially when it comes to your mind, your mind is something that you know the best. You know your mind the best. You know how uh, your symptoms show up in your body. So if you can learn to make the connections, you'll start seeing that, hey, you know, when I'm under stress, how come I'm using my inhaler more? Or when I'm under stress, why is it that my gut starts to to act up more so instead of throwing a pill at every ill we can now go back and fix what's broken and learn to manage the stress that's showing up in our bodies 
So when it comes to this pandemic, boy, have we learned a lot in, in the nine months that this pandemic has been around. Um, we have this pandemic, first of all, humbled us. It brought the medical profession to our knees because we were dealing with a virus so virulent that we couldn't even control it initially. We had no idea what this was about, what it was doing. And in fact, the, the way we treat uh, the COVID-19 patients now is very different than how we treated them initially. Initially, we were putting them all on ventilators because we were treating their symptom, which was low saturation of oxygen. And uh, often that might have been to their detriment. But what we're doing now is, is a very, we've learned a lot. We, we've learned that this virus um, how it's transmitted, for example, we've learned is different than other viruses. We've learned that it impacts your, your it can cause blood clots, it causes different things. So our treatment is now much more aimed at a, a different approach, uh, antivirals or steroids or, or blood thinners, which we didn't know at the beginning. So that was one aspect we've learned. We've learned also that this COVID-19 has affected every sector, hospitality industry, the airlines, medical, uh, social, on every level it has affected. But what we still don't know, and we know there's some light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine, but we still don't know, is this vaccine going to give us um, the immunity we need for long term? Are we going to need boosters? Are we going to have side effects? So my point is, Fear and uncertainty have been such a big part of this pandemic. And fear and uncertainty travel on the same pathway as saber-toothed tigers. They still push on your stress response. So when it comes to infection and immunity, we have to realize that our human body has been adapting to viruses and bacteria for a very long time. In fact, you know, I'll show you on a slide a little later that our body has been exposed to bacteria for millions of years. And viruses have been around for a long time. And it's not a new thing that they can jump to humans. I mean, mad cow disease, the swine flu, all of it originated in animals and then went to humans. And in this case with COVID-19, it started with a bat, that's the theory, went to a pangolin, jumped to a human. So that isn't new. Uh, what is new is that this virus has been very novel in its replication and the way it's transmitted. Um, and it's very rapid acting and affects many different systems. So, so we've learned a little bit, but I wanna show you that when smallpox in the 1700s, smallpox wiped out 500 million people and it was devastating and it began with cows. So the women who would milk the cows, they would sit there and milk the cows and they started getting these lesions on their skin. So they started getting the virus from the cows. They weren't consuming they didn't get it from consumption of the milk, but just by touching the cows and the viral particles would come on their skin, they got, it was called cow maid's disease. So then it was later named smallpox. And then in 1800s, Dr. Jenner decided to take the serum of a little boy who had smallpox and took the serum and injected a small dose into a little boy who was not yet infected in another town. And when the smallpox hit that village, a lot of people got sick, sick, but this little boy didn't. And that was the advent of the first vaccine. So that's how we discovered that we can take a small dose of a vaccine, introduce it into our body, and our immune system can actually make antibodies to that virus. So that was the first vaccine. So now we've learned, okay, this vaccine can, uh, this virus can infect us and uh, we have to do all the safe things, social distancing, wear a mask and, and of course wash our hands and do all those things. But we also found, wait a minute, let's study the people who are getting sick from this virus. What's going on? And we noticed that people who are in their older age groups, people over age 60, 65, the ones who are dying were in their 80s, in fact, the majority. There are a few young people dying as well, but 
very much uh, it, it chose to affect those who were much older. If you had comorbid conditions such as diabetes or hypertension, you were more likely to die from it. But the bottom line, and I want everyone to understand this, the immune system is a very large part of deciding whether this virus makes us just sick or that we get very sick or that we die. So your immune status is very important. There were some older people who were exposed to the virus, but they didn't die. Um, so let's study what is it that gives us a better immune status? What, what can we do to promote and support our immune system? So our immune system is a very complex system. And as I said, it's actually a, an extension of our nervous system. It's a floating brain and it's been going through many, many different replications as our bodies have evolved over the years. And it begins with um, the skin. The skin is a very large organ and it's, it's going to protect us. And then you can go through the mucous membranes, lymphatic vessels, and there's a gland called the thymus gland. And this thymus gland is a very big part of the immune system in children. So children are not getting affected by this virus as much, but as we get older, our thymus gland is shrinking. And in people who are in their 80s, they have a very small thymus gland. So you see that our, our immune system changes as we age. And of course, the immune system is also affected by our diet and by stress and what other things we're exposed to. Now, this virus doesn't get transmitted through the skin. It in fact is transmitted through the mucous membranes in our nose and our throat, and then moves down to the mucous membranes in our lungs. And through the, the immune system, it's important to know there are cells. It's, it's like having this army of many different uh, people to fight, fight this virus. Uh, there are T cells and B cells that can also attack the virus. But I'm only going to highlight two of the areas. One is the gut, and our gut is a very big part of the immune system. It's about a hundred trillion good bacteria that are set up in our gut, and uh, they contribute largely to our immune system for sure. So we have to eat foods that are really good in prebiotics and also cultured foods such as probiotics, yogurt, kefir, kombucha, all those things help our immune system and our membrane so we can keep our membrane in the gut healthy as well. So the good ba gut bacteria are initially acquired as we're born through the mother's birth canal. And these bacteria function to protect the gut. They make a, a mucus that, that protects the lining of the gut. They help regulate the immune function. They also contribute to producing vitamins, vitamin K, for example. And they're sort of mini livers in a sense that they help to detoxify things in the, in the large gut. And of course, there's that neural communication, which we're learning a lot about that our bacteria actually communicate with our brain. There's a very big gut brain connection. And uh, there are some psychiatrists maybe on this call and, and psychiatrists may start to recognize the role of the gut in depression and anxiety and how our brain can get in inflammation when our gut is not working properly. So when it comes to COVID-19 and the mucous membrane in the lung, we know that it attaches to a receptor in the lung and it's called the ACE2 receptor. By the time it attaches to that receptor, you can still exercise some control. Your immune systems you know, has mast cells, it has other factors in the lung membranes that can still fight the infection. But if your immune system and immune status is low, uh, then you're going to have a problem. And then that virus is going to really invade the body. And then it can cause what we call a cytokine storm. It can even contribute to blood clots. And then it can have indirect damage to various um, organs, including the brain. Uh, some people have had a stroke. Some people have had to have amputations. So depending on where uh, the damage is done and your weakest link in your immune system, that's where you're gonna see most of the effects from this virus. So with the pandemic of fear and anxiety and stress, 
how have people been coping? And I just mentioned that many of them are resorting to medication. So the, the pills for anxiety and sleep and antidepressants have gone way up through the roof, but many of them have been doing self-medication. So medication, but not meditation, okay? So the self-medication that they're doing uh, is a way to calm down their nervous system. A lot of them are reaching for caffeine, uh, alcohol, the sales for alcohol and cannabis also went through the roof. So many businesses are declining in BC, but our cannabis business and the alcohol liquor store businesses went up. And if you look at people with weight gain, uh, comfort food, stress eating has been become, uh, become a huge problem. And the quarantine 15 is a common, common way to think about how people are gaining weight because of COVID. So watch yourself and say, how am I coping? How am I medicating myself? What are my soothing behaviors? So it's a really good way to see how have you been coping with this? And, a, and there are people who just sleep it away. They're sleeping a lot more, but then there are others who are not able to sleep. So they're getting insomnia. And uh, some people soothe themselves by, by just watching TV. It's a, it's a, and I have to confess, I did some of that too. And it's a great way to escape, but there are healthier ways to self-medicate. And that's what I want to talk about. So before we begin our toolkit on how to create resilience, it's really important to understand that what I did when I did the research, I, I, I could not, and Nishi and I have had some discussions about this mind and the brain. And many people equate the mind and the brain uh, and use it synonymously, but in fact, they're very different, interrelated, but, but different. So a brain, I could take a, an x-ray, a CAT scan of someone's brain, or you know, when we were doing anatomy in medical school, we could actually visualize a brain. And, and it's, it's something we can see. It's three pounds and it looks like tofu and um, it's very much a physical organ. But the brain's function is to memorize and, uh, and make things easier for you. So it creates neural patterns. So it's like a computer. And the mind, when I was trying to talk to people about the mind, I interviewed psychologists, I in interviewed spiritual scholars, and we couldn't come up with a definition. You know, what is the mind? How do I measure the mind? Where does the mind live? And the mind is spiritual. It's a spiritual dimension, but it's your ability to think about what you're thinking. That science is called metacognition, the ability to think about what you're thinking and connect with the consciousness, that's what your mind is. But it's very important because your mind has the ability to create a program. And your brain just plays a program that your mind is playing. So if you're playing a program of fear, your brain is going to play fear. And when I check your symptoms, I'm just measuring the things on your display monitor. So thoughts are the language of the mind, Feelings are language of the body. And when a doctor asks a patient, how are you feeling? They say, oh, my stomach hurts. I've got a headache. I'm tired. Well, that's what they're feeling. But I have to go back and say, well, examine what are they thinking? How, how is their thought process affecting their feelings? Because the language of the mind is, is the way they think. So we have to, when we're talking to patients about mind and body, we really need to um, examine their thinking process, their mindset. How do they process information and what program are they playing? Are they playing a fear-based program or a trust-based program? So when I designed this reframe toolkit, it was with that in mind. And the reframe toolkit is a great way to boost your immune system, but also create resilience. And a big part of it has to do with how we uh, show up. So R is for reset. And I'll talk about each one in, in, in a minute. Exercise, food, uh, rest, assess your dialogue, mindset, and examine. So let's go through each one. 
The first one is reset. So you saw a picture of the nervous system and that looks like a very complicated apparatus. So, but just think of it as your motor. How do we reset the motor and put some brakes on? So there's a way that you can calm your nervous system down and breath is very powerful. And it seems so simple. We're born and we just breathe. No one has to teach us to, to breathe, but the breath is one way that you can actually put the brakes on. When you take a deep breath in, you inhale and you hold for five seconds and then you exhale and make your exhale longer than your inhale, you've just lowered your heart rate, you've increased your oxygen, oxygen is the drug of choice to, to all the tissues, you've lowered your blood pressure and you've actually improved the blood flow to the gut. So when you do breath work, you're using a big nerve called the vagus nerve. And that's a very powerful way to turn your brakes on. And we don't even think about breathing, but breathing when it's consciously done and done properly is a very powerful way to reset your nervous system. But when I started doing the research, it actually improves your immune system as well. So each time that you take 10 or 15 minutes to calm down your nervous system, you've just given your, your immune system a boost as well. Now combine the breathing with some mindfulness. If your mind is all over the place, we have 60,000 thoughts a day, uh, you're going to notice that you know, your mind is always on. So try to bring the mind into, into focus and use a word, amen, om, peace, love, and put the three together. So do your breathing, inhale, hold, exhale, and say a word. And that's a very powerful way to set your nervous system. Next, everyone knows exercise is good for you. So make sure that you're moving, improve your cortisol, build more killer cells, and also integrate your body systems. Now I'm going to be sending all these slides to Nishi so you can look at them with your own time and um, she'll share them with you. But we want to eat foods because when we're stressed, we choose foods that are very high in carbohydrates that are, that are more what we call stimulant to the body. But if you choose foods that are plant-based, uh, berries, omega-3s, vitamin D is a very good adjunct for the immune system as well. And, and choosing healthy fats and proteins will help your immune system. Rest and sleep are very powerful. So when you sleep, you rejuvenate your immune system and your nervous system. So when you sleep, you make different hormones that will help you to deal with uh, stress. The A in reframe is for awareness and awareness is the agent of change. So starting with how, how do I think, how do I, how do I show up? So being very aware of the thoughts you think is a good start to becoming uh, more resilient. So starting with gratitude, uh, making sure that you're calm when you choose to eat or choose to set intentions for your day. Um, it's a really good way to start your morning with some contemplative prayer or intention setting and doing your breathing because bringing that consciousness to your decisions is very important. Our mind is constantly making decisions, but it is inextricably linked to our nervous system. So that's the, the connection. We cannot control what's going to happen with the vaccine. We can't control the virus, but we can control how we breathe. We can control how we listen to the media, how much we listen. So when you're looking at the diet that you're feeding your brain, also be aware of the people you're surrounded with. Encourage yourself to, to be around people that inspire you, that to motivate you, that lift you up and look at the, the things that we're listening to, uh, be very aware how they bring your energy down. So be aware of the media. We want the news, we want to stay informed, but don't become consumed by it. The other thing for resilience is creating a routine, setting up a health strategy for yourself so that you come out on the other side and you've maintained your routine rather than saying, 
okay, I've got this virus. I can't go to the gym. I can't go to the grocery store. What can you do? So create a routine for being in nature, uh, creating exercise, diet plans for yourself and set up a health strategy with intention. Now, the mindset is very powerful. Like I said, we can play a program of fear or we can play a program of trust. And my patients who play a program of fear often come in and they just have this uh, thinking that whatever they do, it doesn't make a difference. They're, they're very fear-based and they tend to blame external circumstances. They're often victim-based. So it's really important to know what dialogue, what, what program is going on in your head. And, and then cultivate a mindset of resilience instead. So when you show up, you're, you're responsive to your situation. You're not reactive. Reactive would be um, just without thinking, you get very stressed. Responsive would be a very deliberate and a measured response to a situation. So how are we showing up for this pandemic? How are we showing up reactively? Are you under a lot of stress and fear and reacting to it? Or are you responding to it? So it's a really big um, way to shift your mind and say, how am I showing up and try to be more responsive, take responsibility of your health, use that energy, which you're putting into fear and anxiety to create more safety and trust. And so this is the mind body. Um, so there's a, this is a really good one that uh, Nishi wanted me to share with you all. And I use this in my patients. It's a way to uh, stop yourself and exercise metacognition. It's called soda. So first of all, you're relaxing, you're doing your meditation, your prayers. Just stop and observe yourself and say, oh, am I, are my thoughts just automatic negative thoughts? Or am I already rushing to the next step? Am I, am I fear-based? So stop and observe yourself. Then D is for detach. Detach from the fear-based thoughts and then affirm a newer thought that is trust-based. So if you have a fear, oh my gosh, you know, my, my loved one in the elder care home is going to get sick, I'm going to lose them. That might be your thought. Then you can just say, I'm going to do my best to give them all the support they need, give the healthcare workers the support I need and affirm a new thought for yourself that is based on trust, but that's not based on fear. Because if you feed fear, fear will grow and your cortisol and adrenaline will create havoc in your tissues. But you have the same situation and you just reframe it and come at it from a, a, a trust-based approach. So that really cultivates a lot of resilience. So use this soda formula, use the BMW to get you to move from fight or flight into a physical breaks, and then use this for your mind to calm your mind down. The last D in reframe is about examine and evaluate. And it's really important. I teach people that prevention is extremely important. Take charge of your health for sure. But if your symptoms are severe, and you're extremely anxious and you cannot sleep and, and you're debilitated by anxiety or depression is so profound that you're thinking about suicide or, or you, know, you just don't have any hope, there's nothing wrong with getting outside help. So I encourage you to talk to your healthcare provider, go and get examined. I've had patients who were so stressed out that their stress was causing, they had washed their hands so much, they, their hands were bleeding because their anxiety was showing up with psoriasis and eczema. So sometimes we need intervention and we need to have medication and there's nothing wrong with that. And then go back and reset your nervous system again. Uh, but sometimes make sure that you get examined and evaluated when your symptoms are severe. And just know that the vaccine is around the corner there that gives us tremendous hope, but it's not the final answer. We cannot give vaccines to those who are so immune compromised that they'll get sick from the vaccine. So it's still up to you to try to make sure you promote and support your nervous system and your immune system because they're inextricably linked. So try to eat properly, sleep properly, think good thoughts, 
go to bed on time and use the reframe toolkit to, to kind of just get you back on, on track again. And this is a wonderful quote um, that Swami has, um, uh, has uh, I've quoted him. It's a man's well-being depends upon his degree of contentment. So try to look at all the things that we should be grateful for and appreciate what we have and using the power of prayer and connecting with that higher purpose outside, connecting with your, your consciousness will help you to form that trust-based thinking, to help you form that framework. So stay connected to your community and stay connected to your belief and your, your faith and your prayer. And that will really help you to come through on the other side. And many studies have shown, in fact, that uh, people who are faith-based can go through a pandemic, can go through any crisis because they're connected to each other, they're connected to a higher force, and they truly believe that they're going to be okay and everything's going to come out on the other side okay. So um, science, the science of spirituality is that we as human beings are spiritual human beings. We are, we're having spiritual experiences, but we often get caught up in the, in all the, um, the, the nuances of life and we forget that. So stay connected to your spiritual uh, side and it will help your physical side. So as we go from 2020, we're ending the year with masks and we're looking forward to the vaccine. Uh, I just caution you that yes, the vaccine gives us hope, but I want you to still remember that your innate healer, your your ability to connect with yourself and heal your body is really important. So use this uh, toolkit and uh, we're gonna have some time to have questions and answers shortly. If you want to read more, there's uh, the book that I did the research on. You can certainly look at that. And then I will now turn it over to uh, Patricia or Nishi. Thank you, Val. That was a, a great talk. And I'm sure that the audience, we've had a lot of participants um, on the Zoom today. So I'm sure that uh, I'm sure they've all taken something back from the talk and, and from those of us in the healthcare field, um, able to impart some of those key messages to our patients, to our community. And I think it's so important that we all support each other and, and, um, and help each other bring that positivity, those thoughts and help each other's immune system, because we know that there's a power um, in connection, the power in love for each other, and the power in ha having faith and help for each other. So um, thank you so much for sharing that work. And I think Patricia has some questions and there may be some questions from um, the participants and you can certainly share them via the chat box and, and Brother Avi will help us with the, getting those questions out to, to you, Bell. Okay. Thank you, Val, for a great presentation. Uh, it was very clear and, and the importance of how we react to stress <clears throat> can't be understated. Can you tell us why vitamin D is so important in immunity? And are there any other vitamins or minerals that might help us? That's a great question. Uh, vitamin D has been around for a long time. And initially when the government started adding vitamin D to our milk products, milk especially, um, it was just to prevent a disease called rickets. But since uh, vitamin D research has been done, we often give high doses of vitamin D to patients, for example, with multiple sclerosis. And that's an autoimmune condition. So we've been using vitamin D in autoimmune diseases, but some of the compelling data that came out recently is that vitamin D levels in post-mortem samples of patients that died uh, were very, very low. And those people were mostly in uh, nursing homes. They weren't supplemented with vitamin D. They weren't getting outdoors very much. And of course their diet is compromised. So they had very low levels of vitamin D. So 
we're still waiting for more research, but there was a, an association with low levels of vitamin D and lower immune capacity. We think that the vitamin D uh, works on cell membranes. It's a fat soluble vitamin. So we think that it has to do with stabilizing cell membranes. It may be a factor also in um, some of the antibodies that are generated. So they found that in the lung tissue, when people had lower levels of vitamin D, that there was a higher likelihood of that virus invading that, that patient's body. So we're still waiting for the exact mechanism of action in the immune system, but we do know there's certainly an association. So to be on the safe side, as physicians, we can't randomly recommend all kinds of vitamins, but I can safely say that vitamin D, 2000 units a day is a safe way to, to help your immune system. Um, with regards to the other minerals, Patricia, there's been some talk about zinc and and other vitamins, but as a physician, I have to be very responsible about the information I give. So I think it might be better to talk to your healthcare provider about the exact dose, uh, because if you take too much zinc, it can compromise your copper as well. So I think it would be better to, if you're, if you're sick, there's nothing wrong with maybe buying some zinc lozenges, but you have to be very careful how much zinc you take because it can also compromise um, the, the other things. I would spend more time on choosing good foods, phytonutrients, uh, the whole spectrum of all the different berries and vegetables, nuts and seeds, getting our macronutrients from good food and diversity of food would be more important. And you make better choices when you're less stressed. So remember that when you go to the grocery store, put yourself into a mindful state. When you're eating your food, put yourself into a mindful state because you digest better. When you're under fight or flight, you don't digest all the wonderful organic food you just bought or the vitamins that you take. Rest and digest is the opposite of fight or flight. And uh, our blood flows better to the gut when we're mindful. Our secretions in the gut, the acid and bile salts, all work better. Our peristalsis or the, the movement in the gut is better when we're in, in a mindful state, so rest and digest. So I would focus on diet and the mindful digestion and vitamin D. Thank you, Belle. Many of our physicians uh, are rushed and a little bit harried when they're in the office. They're seeing a lot of patients. And a number of them really don't have a background in the mind-body connection. So they're more prone to giving a, a pill as a quick way to solve an issue. And, and yes, it may treat the symptom, but it never gets to the underlying cause. Can you recommend ways that I can talk to my doctor and, and get him to understand that I want to look at a more alternate um, health provision rather than just resort to medication? Um, most doctors will respect your wishes, uh, Patricia, they'll, they'll hear you out. And, and doctors, when we're, we're all trained through the medical system here in Canada, we're, we're taught to at least address uh, the patient's psychosocial state. But there's not a lot of focus on prevention. There's not a lot of focus on giving patient the uh, tools to heal themselves. Certainly that focus isn't there. Depending on your physician and if he's open to having that conversation with you, uh, then certainly I would encourage you to, to say, look, I would like to try a more holistic approach. And then he might offer that you go see a nutritionist or you go see a counselor or try some relaxation techniques. Doctors know about this. It's just that our system has designed it so that they only reimburse doctors for one symptom. So the doctor is in a system that is not set up to provide the kind of holistic care that you should be getting. That's why patients may have to advocate for themselves when it comes to, to these sort of uh, integrative principles, taking care of your mind, taking care of your body and prevention. But the doctor doesn't have the time or resources 
and sometimes a focus on the training of the mind and body, but I'm sure they would mostly be open to it. Would you agree, Nishi? Uh, yes, I, I think so. I think more and more and more, as, especially as the research comes to the forefront around the mind-body connection, around the stress, the physiological effects of stress, that we're actually showing it in the research, that definitely um, physicians are much more open. And I think physicians themselves are now also finding it's so hard to keep giving people medications and there's so much going on. They're seeing all the effects, the side effects of sometimes things that they have to give um, that they are actually looking at a much broader perspective. Of course, we know sometimes you have to take medication. It's important in order for the person to heal, but but as as you said, Belle, you have to start under, under addressing the underlying um, things that are happening in the body that are causing the problem. And Patricia, I might add to that, um, there are some really great, uh, so good things came out of this pandemic in the medical world too. So the good things are, number one, that the pandemic sort of leveled the playing field when it comes to mental health. Before there was a, a stigma attached. If you were anxious or depressed, it was as if you were weaker and you couldn't deal with your symptoms. But now everybody across the board has suffered some kind of a mental, uh, you know, consequence of this pandemic. So talking about your mental condition or talking about stress, it, it's much, the conversation is much easier and it's leveled out the playing field so that there are many good resources. So the community has come together because it's hard to get in to see a psychologist or a psychiatrist, but the, the Canadian Mental Health Association. There are some great apps that you can do uh, at home. Wellness Together is a really good um, resource that is free and it offers mind body and mindfulness. So I think um, if we can just communicate to people that it's okay to talk about your mental health, it's okay to have that conversation and, rec and, your, and if your doctor recognizes it, I think it's important the doctor's role should be to recognize what can the patient do, what can resources do, but where do I need to intervene with medication? So that's where the, the, the physician has to come in. If the symptoms are severe, some people do need antidepressants or anti-anxiety pills. Thank you. Thank you. Can you elaborate a little more on the heart-mind connection? So how do our love and gratitude affect our mind and how can we de develop a loving and positive mindset? Okay, um, so uh, Nishi and I have attended many conferences together and as I told you, we, we have grown personally and professionally and one of the very big things that we learned is that our heart and we've used the metaphor for the heart in many songs and music, Romeo and Juliet, Shakespeare. And we always thought, you know, the heart uh, did have an emotional component, but Western medicine said, no, it's just a glorified pump and it just pumps and that's it. But we now know that sometimes you feel things literally in your heart and your, and your heart has a cardiac nervous system. It has nerves and what we call ganglia and it, and it even makes uh, various hormones in the gut and transmitters and neurotransmitters, which we thought were only made in the brain. So we now know that the heart is is not just a glorified pump. Um, so heart math and the heart brain connection, uh, that's the science of showing that our heart is an electrical organ. If there's energy, we can measure an EKG. And in, the, in our brain, we can also measure energy, our thoughts, we measure all these waves. And when you're very stressed, you'll see these crazy, crazy waves. But when you're relaxed and you're doing your breathing and your meditation and your mindfulness, your brain waves go into what we call an alpha state. So your brain waves can change when you meditate and your heart rate also goes down. So there's a very profound connection electrically and chemically and biologically between the heart and the brain through the vagus nerve. And so what we see uh, when patients are stressed, they can get even changes in the shape of your heart. For example, I had a patient, a lady whose husband died suddenly in a car accident 
and she's 72 years old and they had a wonderful marriage. He just died on the way home from work. And within a few months, this woman who's never had high blood pressure, she's never had increased heart rate, no cardiac problems, ends up in emergency with chest pain. And when they diagnosed her, they said, you have, you have had a heart attack. And she was perplexed. But there's a very profound uh, connection because the heart, it's, a, it's called broken heart syndrome, Takasubo's cardiomyopathy. And there's a wonderful uh, TED talk on our cardiologist talks about how our heart changes shape when we're under emotional stress. So this woman's heart, when we examined it further, had changed shape. Her ultrasound showed that it had changed shape. And after her husband's death, it became the, 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 the blood vessel on the top became thinned out and it wasn't supplying enough blood supply. So she got the heart attack and that's how she was diagnosed. And within a few months of going through counseling, the heart went back to normal. So talk about a mind body connection. I mean, that's something physical that we can see on ultrasound. So there's a very big component of making sure that we live in gratitude. We live in self-compassion. We learn to process grief. And her grief was the loss of her husband. But many of us are grieving the life we knew before the pandemic. We're grieving a job grieving a business that we lost. So there's a lot of grief out there right now, Patricia. Um, we talk to patients every day and um, that grief is really uh, going to affect the way the heart, the mind and body work. So it's important to process that grief and learn to be grateful because gratitude is the opposite of grief. Gratitude is appreciating what is not looking at what isn't. And that's where the, the mind and heart connection comes in. Does that make sense? It does. It does. I could talk to you all day about this topic. It is such yeah, a, it's such fascinating. A, fascinating. Um, Abid, are, do we have any other questions from the audience? Um, yes, actually, we do have a question from uh, a brother who uh, wanted to um, ask his question by audio. So I'll ask um, Brother Shankar to unmute himself, uh, and he can go ahead with his question. Awesome. I first kind of want to say thank you for this uh, presentation. Um, it's an area that I find quite fascinating myself. I'm a third year medical student here at the University of Alberta, oh, okay. and uh, the mind-body connection is just fascinating. And initially, this research kind of made me think about uh, things done at Harvard, especially in the neurological field with Sarah Lazar and cortical thickness with aging. You yeah. may be familiar with that research. So it's something that I that I find fascinating. The question and the inquiry I had for the team here is that I know there's other uh, Western Canadian Sai youth who also share the same interest um, in understanding how our spirituality and how our practices like mindfulness, meditation, service affects our body at a physiological level. What I'm curious is that is there resources um, or places in where we can look to get involved with research. I know from my understanding, a lot of this research is being conducted um, you know, at, at Ivy Leagues like Harvard, et cetera. I'm not too familiar with uh, the research that's occurring here in Canada. And I know um, you have written a book, uh, Dr. Pawa, on, on, this, on this information. So and you're heavily involved in research. I know many on this call are. So I, I think I speak for myself and I speak on behalf of a lot of the Western Canadian youth who who are in the medical field and don't know where to get started if they have an interest here. So I was just wondering if there's any resources or perhaps we could connect on a separate occasion where we can maybe figure out if there's an area for us to kind of um, kind of pursue this interest further. Uh, you're absolutely right. Thank you, uh, Shankar, and good luck with your studies. So glad that you're already at this stage in your career thinking about this. And I, and I teach at uh, UBC Medical School and I'm supposed to be teaching, you know, hypertension, concussion, diabetes, but I take those opportunities uh, when we're doing case studies to bring in the mind-body connection. And um, we've had discussions with the associate dean and the dean to bring in behavioral science and mind-body, but they've really separated out the faculty of medicine 
and decided to do the mind and body more in the psychology faculty. So it's in the behavior sciences, not really into the faculty of medicine. So we don't have, um, the research I did was just on my own. I just did lots and lots of research for the book I was writing and because I had a passion and an interest for it, but I, there isn't a, a formal research center that I know of here in Canada, but I know a lot of physicians who are interested. So maybe, this might be a grassroots to start something with medical students and physicians to try to create a, um, a society or something. In, in the States, there are various centers. So at the Harvard Mind Body Institute, that is a well-established and research-based center. So that's a good one. I know that uh, John Kabat-Zinn, he's not an MD, but he's worked with some of the medical doctors like Dr. Hyman at the Cleveland Clinic, and they've set up mindfulness-based stress reduction uh, research studies. So there's a lot more research now coming. Uh, so Cleveland Clinic and there, the Dr. Andrew Weil uh, Foundation has also done some integrative and Scripps in, in California has also started to do a lot more. So I think it's going to uh, be consumer driven. People are realizing the role of stress and why are we not talking about it if 75 to 80% of the, the symptoms that we're treating are due to a dysfunctional nervous system, then why are we not addressing what disrupts the nervous system? It just makes sense. But unfortunately, there's a bit of a lag to catch up. And uh, so I think we're going to have to, you know, do things like this educational and, and awareness and creating awareness and getting people on board. So it, it's going to, I hope that in my lifetime, I get to see aspiring doctors like yourself and Avi going forward and moving with this. I hope that that's, that's what's going to happen. But I'm at the sunset of my career. So I'm just uh, doing as much as I can. But I'm hoping you guys will carry the torch for future because uh, it's really important. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I do have uh, two questions that were private message to me. So um, I'll start with the first one. How can we tell the difference between uh, fear-based thinking and appropriate precautious thinking? So that's a really great question. Um, that ability to think about what you're thinking, staying in touch with your consciousness is really important because you can tell automatic negative thought or fear-based thinking because it's very outcome-based. So it automatically catastrophizes and goes to the worst case scenario. That's one criteria. Two, you become obsessed by it. So it's repetition and you keep thinking about it. So it becomes a pattern. So that's how you can tell. So if you're very outcome based, the phone rings and you don't even know who it is, but automatically you say, oh no, I bet it's so-and-so and they're gonna tell me this bad news. So that's catastrophizing. So catch yourself thinking, um, and say, oh, I actually go to the worst case scenario, I'm forecasting, it hasn't even happened. Or catch yourself in repetitions and say, oh, there I go again, I did it again. I walked into the room and I assumed automatically that they were poking fun of my shoes or something. And then say, why do I always do that? So stop yourself, use the soda formula to go back and examine your thoughts. And then you can tell, am I just, jumping ahead to the outcome that they automatically rejected me before I even put it through the test. So this is how you can examine your thoughts and realize that you may be caught in automatic, what we call neural circuits. Our brain just plays the same tapes over and over. And it's up to our consciousness to break those patterns, to step back and create new neural circuits that serve us, that work for us and not against us. Fear-based thoughts work against us. Trust-based thoughts work for us because they turn on different chemicals. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from, um, from Bimala. It says, um, I have patients with chronic pain and sleep issues um, <clears throat> and their physical therapy is not um, helping. Uh, is there a way that, um, I guess, physicians and other healthcare providers can refer to um, doctors like yourself or 
Sister Nishi, who have experience in, in holistic uh, medicine? Is there like a database or a uh, online um, that can connect patients to you guys? I think Nishi might speak to that because the chronic pain, uh, are there are a lot of centers with a multidisciplinary approach and I know some of them are using mindfulness-based techniques, but uh, Nishi, maybe you can jump in on that one. Yeah, so certainly, um, thanks for that question. I think that's one of the resources that unfortunately is not available so much in Canada, but um, certainly uh, with integrative medicine, there there is some resources available. And I think that was one of the things that we are going to look at an initiative. Um, the SAI organization has um, partnered with the Canadian Mental Health Organization to work with this course called Living Life to the Fullest. Um, we've, we've been involved in doing a couple of these workshops. It's an eight week workshop, um, training patients, training patients to look at the mind, look at their effect, their thoughts on their body and their symptoms. Um, and it's really based on a cognitive based uh, therapy approach. Um, so I've done the training. We are, uh, have done that in BC. We are going to be uh, starting another set of workshops in January. Um, these, uh, for resources for patients, I find that it's a great resource. You can look at the Canadian Mental Health Association. The courses are usually there available. Many of them are free of cost or, or of a nominal cost. Um, I will be starting one in January. Uh, unfortunately, the program is limited to about 20 participants um, at a time, but certainly those are the type of initiatives that we are going to be looking forward and to in the future and certainly um, through, through the work that we're going to be doing is doing some interactive group work sessions. So that's where we can sort of um, put that out for, uh, for the resources. But there are resources out there. They're difficult to find for patients. Um, and certainly, um, you know, Val and I are sort of do different type of work. We just put the integrative work into our daily work. But as far as really working on cognitive-based therapy, there are some great courses and, and certainly one of the great toolkits that I've um, that we both have sent a lot of patients to is the mindfulness-based stress reduction program, as Belle mentioned by John Kabat-Zinn. Uh, for many of my patients, it's been a game changer. So the, the, the biggest step, I think, us as physicians and healthcare workers are actually op to open the door to patients to say, look, there is things that you can do. And when we give the mind-body um, approach and techniques, validation and credibility, patients are willing to accept because they often have a, um, this thought process that, oh, that's just woo-woo stuff or that's just, you know, in a hocus pocus or they don't believe in it. But when you're actually talking to them and you have a therapeutic relationship with them and you're saying this can actually, you know, change how you're exhibiting your disease, even if you have an existing disease, the expression of that disease, the severity of that disease changes when we regulate it through uh, the stress and decrease the stress response. So I think giving permission to patients um, is, a, is a first step because then they often will find the toolkits that will be able to, uh, that resonate with them, give them some options um, because it's not, a, not necessarily, we can always just find a, a doctor or a physician that's gonna be able to teach them. So that's where I would say to start. Yeah, that's a great, great uh, project. I think that's wonderful you're doing that. Okay. Okay, Sorry, um, so, Abby, do we have any more questions? Uh, no, um, okay. there are no more questions. Okay, I just want to take this opportunity first of all to thank you, uh, Dr. Pawa, to, to sharing your, your message. I know that's that's what, what your whole um, uh, impetus and your passion is to do is and that's why you do these webinars uh, not only for us but for other people is to really spread that message out there that we have something within us that can help us control the whole stress situation and and improve our vitality and health and our immune system um, I so thanks very much for coming and joining and I hope everybody enjoyed that and and we'll look forward to more mental health as well as health uh, webinars in the coming future in, the, in 2021. Thanks. I also want to take an opportunity to uh, unfortunately let everybody know who, if they've just joined in on the call that um, we were certainly looking forward to Dr. Alvarez, Brother Juglan Alvarez, 
um, to speak today, but unfortunately, he's had a very unusually busy week with uh, five transplants this week, and he was up all night with a heart transplant, so will not be able to uh, join us for the presentation today. Um, Brother Alvarez has a wonderful, interesting story. He came from Brazil and his uh, experience with Swami started when he was very young and on his quest, spiritual quest. And uh, he's been blessed with, uh, by Swami's grace and, and has shared a lot of um, what he's learned in his transformation work uh, with his patients uh, at uh, Toronto General Hospital. Now he's, that's where he is now. So we do look forward to um, having Brother Alvarez come on a different occasion, hopefully in the new year, depending on his schedule. So please stay tuned for that, for him to share his heart connection with just what he's learned and also his his journey, his spiritual journey. Um, so I hope that we, Swami will grace us to have that in the near future. Um, I also want to take this opportunity to, to, you know, just put it out to there. Um, you know, you all have our emails for the Sci Medical team. Is that if there's anything that in particular that uh, you would find useful from the medical team to put out there as a webinar, please do let us know. Our focus for the next year will be on mental health, as there is such a big mental health uh, crisis in in the world and in our um, communities. And so, those who us who can uh, learn something for ourselves uh, and learn something that we can actually help to impart to others and, and support others. So um, please do, do share with us anything that you may want to hear from us. I just wanted to say thank you and um, wishing you all peace and resilience and we're all gonna get through this and we're gonna be okay. So thank you for having me. So I'll, I'll sign out. Okay, okay. Sairam, thank, thank you everyone. You. Thank you, bye-bye. Happy holidays and a happy new year. Sai